that the launch of the Arab Youth Research Working Group is an important first step in a promising new direction. Representation from each of the university's faculties and schools means that the group will have a range of expertise necessary to devise a comprehensive interdisciplinary approach to Arab Youth Research and to, analyze, to the analysis, synthesis, and dissemination of key findings. The group will serve as a catalyst for research on youth-related issues and as a focal point for strategists from AUB's many partner institutions in the region and around the world. I believe that the joint research projects initiated by the group today and in the future will lead to, an innovative, to innovative ways of thinking about the many challenges facing Arab youth, as well as realistic policy proposals and options targeting decision makers in different sectors and areas of the region. One of the challenges faced by research initiatives is the translation of academic research into materials which can be used by others, not only policy makers, but also those who spread and popularize knowledge, such as educators and journalists, as well as those like civil society activists and donors who act on it in other ways. Knowledge translation is essential to the development of an informed and engaged citizenry, and a priority of the university, including the Faculty of Health Sciences, the Hassan Faris Institute, and the Arab Youth Working Group. This initiative will also support scholarship, organizations, and individuals through the, its unique open access database offering critical insight into the condition of young people in the Arab world. I, I think uh, the, the last element is an extremely important element, which is building open access databases that can be shared across the world. And not as, you know, it, it, it's a different way of approaching knowledge not as a tool of power, but as something that could be shared across the board uh, uh, with, with multiple audiences and multiple users. This initiative exemplifies what AUB's strategy for the future, uh, serious, in-depth research with a meaningful and positive impact on our region. I offer my thanks to the members of the steering committee chaired by Dr. Reem Afifi for their abiding commitment to the success of this initiative. Dean Imam Wahid and the faculty of, uh, of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and Mr. Rami Khouri of the Hassan Faris Institute for their continuing cooperation and support, 
uh, and also the UNICEF MENA Regional Office, uh, Office for Assisting the San Francisco Institute, Institutes, uh, Ms. Sarah Bitar, in establishing and managing the database based on youth in the Arab world. Thank you. I like you. I look forward to listening and learning more about this initiative, and I wish you all uh, good luck as, as you move forward. Good afternoon. I love Salafi. Uh, I'm Imran Wahid, I'm the Dean of the Effective Health Sciences. I thought uh, uh, I would take a, 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 a different approach to, to my presentation. It's, uh, I would like to start by uh, sort of sharing some info about, uh, about this book. I don't know whether uh, I know that um, some of you have it or have seen it. This is the book on the public health in the Arab world. And I'm going to use it as an introduction to um, how we actually uh, think and uh, of our research and how we work at the Faculty of Health Sciences and, and use it as an example. Um, this book actually um, uh, is uh, uh, published, was published by the Cambridge uh, University Press in uh, March 2012. And it won an award in September of 2012. Uh, it was uh, recognized at the British Medical Association Medical Award, uh, Medical Books Awards, as, the, as a highly recommended uh, book uh, under the public health uh, category. The, the reason I, I mention this is to share with you the story of, uh, of this book. This book is an international, uh, the product of an international collaboration. 81 authors and co-authors collaborated on writing 38 chapters uh, that consist uh, that actually constitute this book. But the real story is actually the way we actually approach all of this. When we got uh, when we signed the contract with the Cambridge University Press, the editorial team decided that this project does not belong to us. This project belongs to the wider group of uh, researchers and practitioners who are interested in the health of people in this region. So what we did, actually, we identified, based on our original data of contents and plan, we identified potential authors, uh, principal authors for the different chapters. We invited them to a workshop at the, at the uh, Van Dyke Hall at our Faculty of Sciences. And we spent, actually, two days discussing and debating what the book is all about. And at the end of the two days, we actually changed the table of contents and thought of new chapters and thought of new authors and re sort of organized the sections of the book. The next workshop was actually a workshop where people came in with their abstracts and preliminary ideas and they were debated again for two days by the others. The whole point of that was transforming the book from being actually a, a, an end product into being a mechanism to bring people together. So the book was published, but it was not the end of the journey. Actually, it was the start of what we refer to as a long-term project now. Now we have actually a community, an online community, that we refer to as the Public Health in the Arab World Community. Uh, it's live, and uh, actually the membership uh, there is more than 300. So we have 300 people who have signed up and are actively engaged there. This book is being translated now. Actually, we're looking now at the sort of editing the translated uh, uh, chapters into Arabic and should be published within a few months and, and make it available to, to other people. The discussion of the Arabic translation has started a new debate. The debate of the terminology of public health in Arabic. We realize that there are a lot of terms in English that have no synonym, no translation, clear translation uh, in Arabic. So there is now a debate that's starting within the faculty and our colleagues within the community that I'm referring to of the fact that it's not a matter of simple mechanical translation of, of the words. It's more about the context of public health in the region, sort of uh, the context of, of public health in, in our culture. I, I'm using this as, as, as an example to say that when we think of youth and when we initiated our ideas about, about uh, research and uh, activities on youth, health, and well-being, we, we actually more or less took the same approach. More than three years ago, I've uh, uh, asked a simple question to many of my colleagues at the Faculty of Health Sciences. 
please tell me what research are we doing in the Faculty of Health Sciences on, on, on youth, health, and well-being. And the answer actually almost consistently was everybody referred to one study, one research project, that research project that was led by, by Rima, Dr. Rima Atifi, on the uh, health of, uh, of uh, young Palestinians in the Burj Barajni camp. When I rephrased that question and asked people about what other projects are taking place, I got a long list of projects that are taking place concurrently at the Faculty of Health Sciences. One of them was on healthy schools. Dr. Majority was actually evaluating the physical environment of 3,100 public schools in Lebanon. And my question was, is this about youth? And of course, you talk about public schools, and you're talking about youth and education. Violence at schools, others were working on that. Child labor and working with children. Mental health, family violence, social skills for the youth, health of the displaced and refugees with a focus on adolescents, tobacco use among the youth, substance use among the youth, reproductive health, and under it there was sexuality, sexual health with the focus on adolescents' health, early marriage, AIDS, nutrition and obesity, traffic injuries, and civil, group, uh, civil society groups and their role with, uh, with youth well-being. In spite of all of these activities running concurrently in the same faculty, reminder, with the smallest faculty, we're only 30 to 40 faculty members engaged. In spite of that, people were not actually aware. Maybe they were aware of other, other, other researchers and other colleagues' projects, but they were not working together. So the simple idea then was, let's actually form an internal faculty of health sciences group that brings, that brought together more than 15 people that actually started engaging in a discussion and presenting to each other. At that point in time, Rami and uh, Khouri and the Isam Faris Institute have actually spotted youth as one of the main themes of interest for the institute. And this is not surprising when we, th we will know that young people in this region actually constitute close to one third of the population. We actually have the highest uh, proportion of youth in global. And people refer to it as the bulge. People refer to it as, as a group that is of concern to societies. The West looks at the youth in the Arab world as a dangerous uh, a, a group. And so we all, and even researchers, are guilty of looking at youth always as, as a source of trouble and actually trying to investigate and looking at the risk factors and their behaviors and their lifestyle. As important as it is, we're realizing, and I think what's happening over the last two years have actually helped us to, to rethink uh, how we do uh, research on, on, on youth and realize that we're not only talking about health and well-being in the sort of the pure and very limited or rigid sort of physical and mental health dimension. We see youth as members of the society. We see youth as mobilizers. And then we can link them to education, to culture, to civil society, political parties. We talk about the voice of youth. We talk about the dignity of youth. We talk about their participation. And, and hence, just thinking that way, the whole idea of, of youth health and well-being becomes transformational. And it actually has helped us to rethink about it. And that it was then that the Faculty of Health Sciences and the Sanfa's Institute started to say, that this is not a project or a group that can only be limited to us. And we need to open it up. And, and uh, we were selected in the beginning. And we said that uh, we, need, we need other disciplines, and we need to work together and actually cross boundaries and think of youth health and well-being in a totally different way. Rima will talk more about this when she describes this, uh, the framework and our thinking. We're still in the process. We don't claim that we have answers. We talk about this, and the reason I talked about the book and all of this to sort of underscore that the success actually lies in the process. We need to believe that if people from different disciplines, different units, different departments sit together and work, it takes more time. We have to break barriers. We have to understand each other. We have to get to know each other. But 
as soon as this is done, as soon as this is done, the world opens up. Because people are really interested in looking at this problem really from an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. We sort of, as researchers and academics, we sort of discover interdisciplinarity. Reality is that if you ask any young uh, uh, person, if you ask any person, young or old, about their lives, they actually think in a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary way because they think of their life, their opportunities, their jobs, their communities, their families, their children, their parents. They cannot think of themselves isolated from the surrounding. That's the sort of the thrust for, for why we thought it's important to open it up and sort of this collaboration between ASAMFAS and FHS on the youth uh, health and well-being becomes, becomes an open opportunity and, and, and sort of is enriched by, by, by the input of other disciplines and grows to include, uh, to include others. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karima. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. President, for being here and, and everybody for uh, attending and our partnership with the Faculty of Child Science. So, uh, you know, is uh, one of the most uh, exciting and I think productive elements of IFI's work uh, to date, and we're extremely excited about this. And uh, we also went through a process over the last four or five years. In, uh, in, in really learning about many things. Um, the, the single most important thing I think we learned is that none of the issues that we identified when we started in late 2006, none of the issues could be tackled um, through one, the lens of one discipline. Uh, and youth in particular, but also the other things we looked at, Palestinian camps, climate change environment, the UN in the Middle East, the international relations, all of the subjects that we address at the uh, San Fabs Institute are extremely multi, uh, multi-sectoral, but youth in particular is the most, uh, most complex in many ways. And, and we also realized that we had a distinct uh, role to play as an autonomous public policy institute or think tank in an academic institution, AUB. We had to discover how is it that we can be most effective in bridging the worlds of the research and the teaching that AUB does and the outside world of public policy influencing and uh, the marketplace of ideas uh, that is in the environment all around us and in the entire Arab world and we work at the level of the Arab world. How to bridge those two worlds was something that we needed to learn and are still uh, learning. But we realized that there were a series of events or uh, activities that needed to be done and we think in this uh, youth working group now we are starting to bring all this stuff together with our partners of the faculty of health sciences uh, as, as the core managers but with professors from all over the university as the key researchers and these activities include uh, doing basic research in many fields doing interdisciplinary research together which Rima will tell you about some very exciting stuff that we're planning uh, generating data and storing data, sorting it, archiving it, and making it accessible to the public in searchable databases, which you'll hear about now. Uh, sharing knowledge rather than hoarding knowledge. I mean, we generate knowledge, but we share it. Um, convening workshops. One of the things that we've learned very quickly is AUB has incredible convening power, partly because everybody in the Arab world loves to come to Beirut, but mostly because they come here in an, an open atmosphere of real intellectual rigor and discussion. And they learn. And they learn and they teach us and we learn from each other. And this convening power of AUB is, is something very powerful. And we uh, very quickly, we learned that by bringing people together from all over the region, we can learn much more together than we can on our own. And then the issue of uh, trying to influence or inform or impact policy is the hardest thing that we have to try to learn. And we're in the very early stages of understanding how policy happens and how you can use knowledge to influence policy. And that raises the, the probably the single most important uh, point that we think we should do as an institute, a, a policy institute anchored in an academic university, which is knowledge translation. How do you take this technical knowledge that professors and researchers produce and put it into a form that is accessible to the media, to public policy officials, 
to educators, to civil society groups, to religious groups, to civic groups, to all kinds of people in society who should have this knowledge, whether it's about smoking or about safe driving or uh, sexual behavior or environmental protection or clean water, whatever it may be. So knowledge translation is emerging as one of the most important fields that we have to address as a public policy think tank or, or policy research institute. Um, and, and it's not an accident that the Faculty of Health Science is also embarking on a major uh, endeavor in this area too, and we will collaborate with them and many other people at AUB and around the region. So all of those activities, we, we, we learned these over the last four or five years, and we're, we're pretty much sorting them out now and, and getting them organized. But when you take all this and you apply it to young people, I think what becomes clear, and now we're in the beginning of the third year of the continued uprisings and fathers and revolutions and transformations of the Arab world, uh, I think this, the simple fact is that because we didn't, as policymakers, or maybe as academics and public sectors, or as media, or as political parties, or as civic society, or as all of us, we didn't pay enough attention to the realities of the worldviews and sentiments of our young people. And so they decided they were going to change our world. If we weren't going to improve their world, they were going to change our world, and that's what they're doing. They're turning systems and countries on their head, sometimes violently, sometimes with a lot of pain. Uh, but the, we're passing through the single biggest moment of change in the modern history of the Arab world since the Arab state system was formed almost a century ago. And most of this has been initiated and driven by young people. But what we learned very quickly is that the sentiments of young people are widely shared across the region by adults as well. There's very little difference in the views of young people and adults in almost all the important issues uh, of life and governance and politics and power and dignity and respect and uh, well-being and aspirations in any field almost. The percentage points between youth and adults and polling is usually two or three percent, no more than that. So studying youth is the best barometer for understanding what your entire population feels. And studying youth is the easiest way to do it because youth is the most open. The, they express themselves most freely. They're the least scared. They're the least inhibited. They talk openly. They now express themselves on the web. There's an incredible amount of knowledge on the, on the web that we can, uh, we can harness. And we've learned that, that to understand youth better and their views and their sentiments and their aspirations and their sense of their rights not as young people, but as young citizens. Because the, the key issue at the beginning of the third decade, of the third year of the Arab uprisings, is citizenship. The rights of Arab men and women to be treated by their own societies as citizens with rights and responsibilities. And young people are expressing these uh, issues very, very, very clearly. And we've, we've learned very quickly that it's not just jobs or schooling or housing costs, or food availability, or political participation, or corruption, or transparency. It's not any one of those issues that drives these revolutions. It's the mixture of all of them together. And therefore, they can only be studied in a, in a, a mixture of disciplines that come together to understand how these different issues, what is the balance between the material needs of a citizen in terms of housing, and water, and schooling, and healthcare, and the intangible needs of a citizen in terms of respect and dignity and these words, the justice, these, these, these uh, uh, nouns, these abstract nouns that people use, uh, justice and dignity, they mean everything, but they also mean nothing. Uh, so somebody says, I want dignity, so fine. Uh, what does it mean? And so this is why we're starting to look at these issues, and Rima will, will talk more about uh, this about in our research uh, project. Uh, and I would just say that we, we learned very early on in our work at, at IFI when we partnered with the, the UNICEF uh, Middle East North Africa Regional Office to do a group to report on Arab youth, and some of you in the room here were involved with it. We uh, brought together about 60 to 70 scholars from around the region, some from the UB and other places, and, and we, we originated some new research, again, some was done by AUB scholars and other people. All of it is published on the website. We brought together as much knowledge as we could harness on Arab youth. Uh, and we made sure that we had a lot of input from Arab youth themselves directly and indirectly. And we ended up identifying a series of issues. This was 2009 and early 2010, before the uprisings broke out. And it's, it's useful to go back and just look at the issues that we identified 
as the critical ones for young people. And it was about identity and values, about civic and political participation, their expression through the media and other ways, capacity for self-expression, their autonomy and role within the family, the situation of adolescent girls in particular, uh, sexuality among Arab youth, migration, uh, youth in situations uh, of violence. Those were the key issues that young people themselves identified or scholars who studied youth identified before the uprisings began. And we look at the situation today, and in every single one of those areas, the situation today is probably more difficult than it was two or three years ago. And certainly is more difficult in terms of employment, income, housing costs, food costs, the, the material standards of life, water quality, transport system, public transport, and almost every situation in life in Tunisia, and Egypt, and Libya, and across the region, things are more difficult now than they were when we did this report two, three years ago. So the question becomes, there's more urgency now to understand the complex relationships of the different dimensions of young people's lives. And this is what AUB and others like our AUB around the region and our colleagues are uniquely placed to do, because we have economists and social psychologists and political scientists and, and <coughs> medical uh, public health people from different disciplines who can understand these different uh, dimensions and hopefully we bring this together um, in a manner that uh, helps us understand what is happening in the lives and in the minds of young people. But equally important, we believe that the challenge is, in a way that's the easy part, because that's what people like our professors do and our researchers do all the time. The hard part is how do you take this knowledge and use it to improve the lives of young people and adults around the region? How do you reach the public policy people? How do we get this stuff into the, uh, into the media? How do we get knowledge into the education system? Uh, this is the real challenge. Uh, and we, we think that with this working group, we have a chance to do this uh, more efficiently than any of us could do it alone. And this is also the, the beginning of what we hope will be a, a, an expansion regionally where we're already in talks with partners around the region to create a regional uh, knowledge consortium of researchers on youth-related issues, which will be anchored at AUB, we expect, and, and working throughout the region. Um, so we're very excited about this, and I again thank our partners at the uh, Faculty of Health Science, the support of the Provost, and all of the professors at AUB who have uh, worked with us, and our many partners also from uh, around the region. Thank you. that we, uh, we are also launching today along with the AUB Youth Research Working Group. Um, the uh, Youth in the Arab World Database uh, is a project that we started since 2009. Uh, it, we see it as a tool to promote local research, research <coughs> about youth in the Arab world from the Arab world. Uh, we also see it as an opportunity to provide an open source about research being done about Arab youth. Uh, it is research focused, it will not present any first-hand data, but it collects research done on youth uh, from different institutions, uh, from AUB and from outside AUB, uh, and um, it, it collects it uh, under different themes that we're going to see. Uh, it also uh, lists the institutions and researchers and authors who, uh, uh, pr who produce literature on youth in the Arab world. So that's also key because we couldn't find uh, any database uh, in the region that uh, includes the institutions that work around youth. But it's also research focused. So it doesn't include uh, individual projects that are done on the grass grassroots level. It rather focuses on research. Um, it's also, it's also a tool to promote collaboration because it will help people know what's outside, who's doing what, and who has done uh, what in the past. Uh, the idea of the database came, as, as Rami mentioned, as a part of a partnership that was between the Sun Institute and the uh, UNICEF MENA Regional Office. 
and uh, it started in 2009 with uh, Ms. Munira Habballah as coordinator. Uh, and uh, we decided to launch it now, um, three years or more after, um, along with the uh, report that we uh, launched last year. Um, so we thank UNICEF for their support. Uh, its target audience is uh, diverse scholars, policy makers, researchers, youth reporters. It's very user friendly as you will see now. So uh, it's an open source for everyone. Uh, so now we can take a look at the database. Um, so uh, you can search for publications, for authors, for institutions. Uh, Mainly the entries that we have now are in English. We have some in French and in Arabic, but that's an area that we're going to expand in the future, in the near future, hopefully. And you can uh, search by country, you can search by topic, uh, you can search by language, by type of publication, and we have all uh, different types of publications. We have reports, we have uh, a journal articles, so it's not just focused on uh, uh, publications by scholars or in academia. It also has reports done by uh, organizations and uh, international agencies, UN family and so on. Um, and of course by date and other features. And uh, that was it. Thank you. Thanks again for all being here. And I want to thank uh, the provost, uh, the United, uh, Jan Khoury, um, for all their support over the last year and a half as we've moved this forward. And Sara Bittar, who's been actually the engine behind this and keeps me on my toes and makes sure that things get done um, amidst all the various other things that, that uh, we all have to do as academics. I also wanted to note that uh, you can easily see the generation gap and the difference in presentations between Sara and myself. Um, so I haven't yet figured out Prezio or whatever that style of, uh, uh, I'm going to do a, a very old-fashioned PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, but thank you for, for hanging in with me on the, on the old-fashioned. The pictures that you'll see on here are from a youth project that we were involved in, but we've gotten permission to use them also, just as a, as a, as a note. All right. So what we're doing today is launching the AUB Arab Youth Research Working Group. Um, and the group is hoping to uh, bring together AUB faculty working on issues related to youth from various departments and disciplines with the intent to research, synthesize, and disseminate quality research on youth well-being in the Arab world, and we look at well-being very, very broadly, um, as well as bring practical, relevant, and, situa and situated recommendations to the policy-making process across all sectors dealing with youth. Thank you. So those are sort of the aims of the working group. Why youth? I think everybody knows this in this room, but just to review, um, and as already mentioned, uh, youth in the Arab region, if we take 15 to 24, and various organizations will define it differently, they'll go down to 10, they'll go up to 30, so there's a, there's a wide range of um, possibilities in terms of what we consider young people in the region. They constitute anywhere from 25, 25 to 40% 40, 40 of the population in our countries. We've never had a youth generation that's been so large. And as mentioned by uh, uh, Iman, our region is the youngest region uh, in the world. There's a lot of issues related to youth. Unemployment is very high in our region among youth. Education is clearly not preparing youth for the job markets. Inequities among youth and between youth and others are rampant in all of our countries and getting worse. Um, and so basically their needs aren't met in our region. <coughs> but all of this I think highlights a lot of the negativity ar around youth and I think more importantly we need to focus on the positive aspects of youth. And so youth are really a great asset um, in our communities. They are clearly change agents, always have been and continue to be. And they're very powerful catalysts in their own and their community's development. And I think this is where we actually want to focus um, our, our, uh, our research and our working groups on emphasis. And they keep us who are not youth <laughs> young, <laughs> no longer youth. Um, as any of you who have worked with young people and are no longer young can attest. 
why multidisciplinarity? I'm actually not going to go into the benefits of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, whatever words that you want to use, there are differences actually between them, but I'm not going to go into the benefits of that. I'm assuming that we all buy into the fact that multidisciplinary research creates creative, innovative solutions to the problems that are very complex in our world. But um, what I want to say is that youth has attracted a lot of attention in recent scholarship, whether internationally or in, in, in um, the Arab world. Um, but that the research that has been done is often dominated by specific themes and reduces the well-being of young people to specific social or economic indicators. And there's a lot of work on employment or on education or on health. Um, but in fact, young people themselves don't categorize their lives that way at all. Um, in fact, what they do is they just live in their personal, social, and physical spaces. And everything that goes on in those spaces for them is one. It's not categorized. So I think this is the importance of us um, as disciplines thinking together, because that's how we negotiate with young people and understand their lives better. Why a youth working group at AUB? Um, I think it's very important to say that we're not starting this initiative because we're assuming there's nothing that's been done. In fact, quite the contrary. So in, in fact, we're starting this initiative because we know that so much has been done at AUB by various people in various faculties on youth issues. And so the first place of start is that we're acknowledging um, at the AUB level the vast amount of research, excellent research, that's done with and about youth at AUB by various faculty members. Um, so what we're trying to do, though, is raise the profile of all this research as a thematic at AUB and enhance the synergies and the linking of people and ideas together, um, synergistically and multidisciplinarily. And in fact, we believe that it's, this helps and, um, and provides a platform for enhanced funding. So when we, can, we, when we can showcase our work as multidisciplinary work, thinking about all these aspects together, engaging youth as I'll go into, that actually gives us much more opportunity to find the, the funds together that we, want, that we need to do the important work that we want to do. To date, what has happened in the Youth uh, uh, Research Working Group at AUB is that a steering committee was established to guide the conceptual thinking behind the working group. It had members from almost every faculty, um, and they're listed up here. The working group has met, has met three times and debated a lot of, um, sort of core aspects of a, con a, con a conceptual framework, which I'll share with you. But we've also had a lot of email exchanges and other types of um, communications. The hardest part about the steering group, um, and I would guess the working group later, is actually finding a time when everybody is free during the week. And so we've often had to do that a month ahead of time. And it's just been very difficult to find time because everybody's doing many other things, including their own research, of their own disciplinary important research. One of the things that we have worked on as a steering committee and that we want to just sort of share with you at this point, and it's open to um, tearing apart actually, and that's the whole point, to present something that we can all add to, is how we want to think about young people in this uh, research uh, group for youth at a &B. And this is um, the conceptual framework that we've come up with to date. It was a very interesting discussion amongst the steering group committee members that came, uh, as you saw, from a variety of disciplines because every person was bringing in very interesting aspects of how they think about young people. So um, I'm, just, I'm just gonna go over this very um, briefly. What I wanna start with is the sort of the two ends, pre-adolescence and adulthood. So in our discussions in the steering group, we really see youth as a point in time, or maybe not a point, uh, a segment of time, that's actually preceded and influenced by a lot of factors that happened before that. So a lot of what occurs to children or what happens in the lives of children actually influences who they are as young people and how they think as young people, etc. But the same thing also happens at that time period. So what happens to young people during youth will influence what, how, how they are as adults and who they are as adults and what opportunities they have as adults. And, and, and sort of cycle back to children in the second generation. So as they have children. So it's a time period that we are looking at sort of uh, with a lens, but we understand that it's bounded and framed by what happens before and binds and frames what happens after. I think that's the first thing that we want to say. Um, I'm then going to go into the middle and talk about the fact that we sort of focused in on youth well-being very broadly defined, how they feel, how they just, in general, as much as you want to put into there, psychologically, socially, 
spiritually, physically, all of that. Um, and that we understand and acknowledge that there are two aspects of that well-being, and various disciplines are more or less comfortable with the different aspects. There's a very subjective aspect of how young people feel and act and behave, and, um, and there's an objective aspects of those, and that we're interested in the working group of looking at both of those and the interaction between them. We understand that that well-being is influenced by a whole variety of factors, at the individual level and beyond the individual level. And so at the individual level, we've talked a lot about behaviors, whether it's their personal behaviors, their media behaviors, their agency, um, and their cognition. Those two as very specific individual aspects. But then beyond the individual aspects, so you also get at the bottom sort of left, knowledge, attitude, skills, self-efficacy, all of those are very individual. But then beyond that, you also have the fact that their well-being is very influenced by their family, um, their peers, who they're engaged with, what types of supports that they get, the types of interactions and social relationships they have, um, uh, the community and family norms that they live in, national and local policies, so a lot of things that are happening in and around their community, their, their friends, their teachers, their physicians, their parents, you know, all of those things, in addition to the organizations that they're involved in, NGOs, schools, etc., community, and then national and local policy. Um, and uh, one of the aspects that was very interesting to think about and brought in by sort of the FEA uh, um, uh, members of the steering committee was the whole aspect of space. So how does built environment actually influence all of what's happening among young people? Where do young people hang out um, in places where there's no place to hang out? And the whole concept of space and space definition. And interestingly then, we also link that back to a very sort of modern concept of cyberspace. So space is a very interesting thing to think about um, in both its physical and less physical sense and how um, all of that influences youth. And that sort of, we, we thought, um, influences various aspects. It influences the family, the community, the individual, the organizations, everything. If you go a little bit to the top, we acknowledge that no matter what happens in a smaller space, uh, in terms of individual, peer, school, family, organization, community, there are these much more um, perhaps intangible, but perhaps more influential uh, forces that also impact young people that we can't ignore, including social, economic, po political, legal, and media systems at a variety of levels, including the global forces um, of globalization, global trade, uh, global economics, global politics, all of those things. And so we can be doing excellent work um, on the ground, but if we don't acknowledge and work towards these much broader concepts, um, we're not able to, um, to provide the environment that supports enhanced well-being completely. Um, and, and so then the last aspect of this, and which you'll see in the principles, is that we're hoping that this youth research working group is actually about change, um, working with youth on change, uh, not, not for youth on change. And so that's the, the point of intervention, that we're hoping that our understanding of all this actually leads us to thinking about programs and policies that enhance the well-being of young people and provide them with an environment that is dignity promoting and allows them to grow into adulthood um, in the best possible way. And we'll open this all for discussion um, in a little while. Some of the draft principles that we I think will guide the work of the Youth Research Working Group at AUB, um, and these just came out of sort of the, the very broad discussions in our steering group meeting. We never really specified them as this, as this and that's why I'm calling them draft principles. One is um, that we're hoping that, that much of the work that we do is participatory, in that it's inclusive of youth and their voices. That we're not, uh, there are many of you in this room that are young people and are youth. But many of the steering uh, committee members, and uh, I would guess the vast majority of the faculty members that may be working on this working group, ha are no longer youth. Uh, they may be closer or farther from youth, but they're no longer youth. And so we may uh, not understand uh, the. <laughs> we may not understand exactly uh, what youth are going through today, um, because it's very different, I think, than uh, at least I speak for myself. But we're all, um, we're all very much linked to uh, young people and, and what happens in their lives is very much important, is very linked to the way that we think and interact, either because we have youth in our families or um, a 
uh, sisters or children, etc. And because as a group, they're very important to, to what happens and in assets, as I said. We also, uh, as we've said many times, are hoping that the work that we do is multidisciplinary and collaborative, that um, it's, of course, based on research and evidence, <coughs> that it's action research that leads to change, which is linked to the next point, which is that it's focused on implications, on knowledge transfer to practice and policy, that it involves students, both undergraduates and graduate students, um, that it has a regional scope. So these are some of the guiding principles, and of course we'll add to many of them that, um, for the youth to receive. I'm going to give an example of one of the types of projects that uh, a group like this might engage in. And this is one of the ideas that came out of the steering group. And uh, it's a proposal for a project in Hush Beirut. I don't know, I'm guessing that most of you know about Hush Beirut. It's a, a relatively uh, large area that's been closed off for a long time. But it's an area where people could gather if, um, if the, the, it was open. It also was founded by um, very different types of sectarian communities. And the steering committee uh, came up with the idea of actually trying to engage with uh, the communities around Hush Beirut, all of them, and look at um, the situation of young people in that area very comprehensively from the various disciplines that are involved, both in the steering group and any of you that are interested in this kind of project. So the proposed title is sort of um, Youth Wellbeing, Its Components and Consequences in Individual, Physical, and Social Space a multidisciplinary approach using community action research. And what we're hoping is that we will assess the components and consequences of youth well-being in a very complex community context um, in Beirut, Lebanon. And that the guiding frameworks, of course, are the conceptual models that I just outlined, and community action research, where communities are very actively engaged in um, the definition of the problem as well as uh, the definition of its solution. The community including young people and beyond young people. So it's the type of work that this kind of a group would engage in. Not all of the research project needs to be as multidisciplinary as we're considering this one, but we would hope that almost all of them have at least a few disciplines involved, two or three, if not more. So what do we see as next steps? This is a launch of this uh, larger group, um, and uh, we hope that many of you are interested in signing up. Um, and there are, I think, a variety of benefits to it. Uh, and we can talk about those benefits if you're not convinced. We do consider this an open, fluid, dynamic group, so whoever doesn't sign up now can continue to sign up whenever. It's not a closed group. We're hoping to launch a lecture series um, on youth, and again, if you're interested in presenting the work that you've done on young people, we would welcome that. We're thinking about launching a call for proposals, and again, the more multidisciplinary the proposal, the more uh, I think this youth working group would be interested in it. We're hoping to launch the Hush Beirut project very soon. And then also link graduate students who are interested in youth issues with faculty members who are working in youth. So again, we may be crossing boundaries in terms of linking a graduate student in a particular discipline to another faculty member in another discipline once we have a feeling of what's, what's uh, you know, the range of stuff that's happening at UB. And we have been collecting, so has been collecting for the last two years now, um, and talking to um, faculty members who are working on youth issues and a variety of other things, et cetera. So I'd like to open the floor to your ideas, your thoughts, uh, your guidance, um, all of that. Uh, and thank everybody for being here again. Thank you. Uh, this research you were talking about uh, 
uh, the knowledge you get and then translate it, the, the, that knowledge and then the objectives or goals uh, uh, on the longer term are to change like uh, the, the, the situation of those uh, young people basically through uh, amending policies or all of that. Uh, is there any component within that project that is relevant directly to the empowerment of those youth themselves and engaging them in the change process? those two questions and we can open for more. So I think right now we're seeing it uh, as a project that's mostly an AUB project uh, for both faculty members and students at AUB. I'm sure that that will expand rapidly uh, outside of AUB just in, types, uh, in, the ty in the types of projects that we're going to engage in. But right now we're trying to just uh, um, uh, sort of solidify uh, what's happening at EUB in terms of user research and understand it well um, before we open up. The, the, the idea behind the Hirsch Beirut project or a project like that is in <coughs> fact to start with young people. So the whole assessment of um, what their needs are comes from them and they are engaged in defining their needs, defining the solutions, etc. So the faculty members come in with some ideas of um, potential issues that may be from their research important to think about. But it's also very open to young people saying, actually, media is more or less important, or space is more or less important, or you've forgotten this thing. And uh, actually having a very active, hopefully, young people's group or coalition that is guiding the whole process uh, throughout so that the solutions come from and with young people. They're not, they're not done for them, they're actually uh, as we've seen, very powerful change agents in their own community. Do you have future plan to go outside Beirut and conduct any research, let's say, for Mediterranean, let's say, youth living in this area, and compare them with youth living in Vietnam and see what are the differences between both to see really how these different societies are? Thank you. Okay, so that's a good question, and um, um, I think that the steering uh, um, group members, and there's some of them around here that they can jump in if they think I'm, I'm not speaking for them, but uh, so this project, the Hushway Group, as a model, so we're, there hasn't been, as far as we know, very many uh, projects that have actually looked at um, um, youth well-being in such a multidisciplinary way and engaged a variety of disciplines and young people themselves in thinking about the issues and problems in their lives and finding solutions. So we're seeing it as a model that once we understand and learn from what are the things that work and don't work in this kind of a model can actually be expanded to very many places. The, the type of, um, this type of research is actually very uh, time intensive because the, the moment that one um, is really into a participatory process, uh, the power isn't anymore in anybody's hands, it's in everybody's hands, which takes a lot of work in terms of coming to, to consensus on what are some possible um, factors that are influencing young people. There's a lot of, it's a very time intensive process. So, and this is one of the research projects that any of us would be engaged in. Uh, so I think each of the members of the working group and the steering committee have their own research agenda that's very disciplinary, and this is in addition to that. So we're trying to balance between really wanting to come up with innovative and creative ways to look at young people, and at the same time be able to do um, the rest of the tasks that we're required to do as academics. And so do a project very well, learn from it, understand from it, and then definitely move forward to other places. One of the reasons that we picked uh, the Hesh Beirut area is that we feel like uh, there's a lot of potential um, issues that are very current in the Lebanese situation that, that will come out of that particular area. Um, and so we debated pros and cons of a variety of possible areas. And uh, one thing about Hesh Beirut which we liked is it's, it's complex, um, it, it's, but at the same time it's close. And I know that that's not the greatest uh, reason um, to engage in a project like that, but it does matter in terms of the time that we're each able to put into this at a time when we're trying to explore a mechanism and methodology for looking at young people. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, yeah. <coughs> um, my name is May Farah, I'm an assistant professor at Media Studies here at UB. Um, my, uh, what, when you're thinking, when you're talking about youth in the Arab world, uh, it sounds like a very kind of monolithic group, and as we all know, it's not at all monolithic. And so, you know, like I've done research with youth in the camps, and that's very different than youth at AUB, and it's different, very different than youth at Saudi Arabia, or you know, the different circumstances and the context in, with, in which youth are growing up will automatically, you know, give them different priorities about what's important, what kind of, you know, situation they're concerned about or facing. And I'm just wondering how then, you know, we, we don't want to make the mistake of kind of treating youth as one group with similar concerns. And so how do you go about then prioritizing or, you know, addressing the, the different kind of concerns of different youth in different countries within one region? Uh, all right, so I think this is very important as well. Youth are not one group, they're a variety of suburbs. Um, and I think that sort of comes back to the methodology that's being used here. So I don't think that we're proposing to come up with the, um, uh, I think the Dean was talking about process rather than outcome. And I think that's the focus of this group. It's about process, about how we think about thinking about youth. Um, and the outcomes of that thinking will be different with different groups of young people. But the important thing is to engage them in that thinking and figure out for each group what it is. I would guess that there are some things that will cross-cut all young people, irrespective of place, irrespective of age, irrespective. But there will definitely be different priorities among those things and some that are very specific to space and place. But I think it's, the, it's more the research methodology or the process of engaging use and thinking about this, so the conceptual model, that there are a variety of factors that influence young people, the multidisciplinary aspect of it, the participatory aspect of it, the community-oriented aspect of it. Those are the things, I think, that will help us understand youth, and that's what we're hoping becomes the model, not the outcome of the specific intervention or the specific um, problem that we're targeting in any one particular. I can add uh, to that also. One of the uh, purposes of the database that we were, we've launched, and by the way, the, the database, if you want to go to it, it's Arab Youth Info, ArabYouthInfo.com, and it's now uh, accessible. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge Nina Abolo, who's with us today. She worked on this two years ago and uh, was one of the central players in our uh, early youth project. So thank you, Nina. Welcome back. Um, the, uh, the database will be one tool that we will use to uh, aggregate available research that's done all over the region, which much of which uh, gives you the sentiments of young people through surveys, through focus groups, through research that's done, through various <coughs> ways. Um, and when we did the report uh, with UNICEF on the regional uh, condition of young Arabs, um, young Arab men and women, we uh, tried to identify as many sources as we could, which allowed young people to speak for themselves. And we were able to aggregate a lot of uh, information and views, and we sifted through them. And then, and of course, in meetings with young people, but there's many ways that you can you can listen to the views of young people. There are many different views, um, and one of them is through looking at surveys that are done and polls that are done regularly around the Arab world. And, we started a process a few years ago, and we'll continue it through the uh, through the IFI youth program, probably, which is just to bring together every year people who do surveys and polls of our youth, bring together five or six people, and to compare notes from people who have this in-depth, uh, uh, widespread view of young people's attitudes from many different countries, and to share notes. Uh, so there's many different ways that we think we can identify issues that matter to young people. Um, and, and that's a starting point, I think, for many of the uh, projects that we would like to uh, look at uh, in, in different ways, whether it's individual research projects that professors do or other researchers do or collectively. Uh, and I think this is more important than ever now in view of what's happened in the last two years, that if we're not sensitive to what young people feel, uh, it could be a source of uh, instability or, or problems, or as we've seen, uh, wars and revolutions, uh, which are, you know, you can argue in different ways whether what's going on in the Arab world is good or bad, that everybody has their own views, but it's certainly turbulent and it's certainly painful to a lot of people. So if, look, if we can hear these 
uh, sentiments early on, identify them, listen to them, acknowledge them, take them seriously, and then figure out, okay, what's the underlying problem and what can be done about it by government, by private sector, by donors, by educators, by civil society. That would be a better way to deal with the world than we did in the last uh, several generations of essentially uh, not making a country disease uh, very well. You indicated that it is really research and then developing policies. Uh, is there any thinking to follow through the policy application or influencing the different decision makers to change what is available and what's happening to make the life not only of the youth but of the public as a whole better? And not only in Lebanon, this could be as well in the other Arab countries. Yeah. Uh, actually, this is very much similar to what I wanted to ask. My name is Rani Saba Ayan from Masar Association and also the Youth Forum work on youth policy in Lebanon. And yes, youth policy is multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary, bottom-up from young people to the government, etc. And I, just, I understand very well when you say that you have focused on the process because it has been a success in itself. And with us as well, to make sure that young people's voices are heard, their ideas are being shared, I be, I, I, they reach out to decision makers, this is also a success. It gives them more self-confidence. My question again to add up to what uh, the lady has just said, it would be great if this research uh, can be really shared with young people to maybe validate it more with young people and to convey to decision makers. Have you made this link between the three, the youth and civil society, academics and policy makers or decision makers? Thanks. Okay, so the whole, actually the whole point is research for practice and policy. Uh, so this is not about, not, that's why I started off saying it's applied research. So this is, this is a research that leads to changes in practices and policies. Changes in practices are sometimes easier than changes in policies. We want to work on both of those aspects. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it depends on what we're talking about. And uh, there's sometimes there are different people that are good at the different aspects. There's there's people that are excellent um, at at engaging policymakers and decision makers in policy change, and there's people that are excellent in sort of more field-oriented practical work, and, and we need all of it for those people. So definitely, I think the intent is to uh, move this to practice and policy. That takes time, and so the whole part of, the, the initial part is the assessment. I mean, so what is there? What do we need to do? What are some potential solutions? What are the policies that need to be thought about differently? What are the practices that might change? All of it should be invo involved youth. All of it should drive youth. And actually youth are, the, are the, the key factor in actually engaging with decision makers themselves. So definitely the link between the three is there. And this is, I mean, community-based research, community-based participatory research is all about the links between all of us. So in fact, as academics, we are just facilitators of a process. We're not experts that come in and tell anybody anything. Um, we're facilitating a process where we all understand together. We bring in our particular skills and expertise. Youth bring in their particular skills and expertise. Community members also. Everybody brings in what they have, and together we understand the situation better and figure out what the possible solutions are better uh, uh, are available. Taking into account, of course, things that have happened and worked other places, but mostly taking into account what is relevant and contextual in our uh, in our particular situation. So. Just to add to that, um, the whole purpose of the establishment of our institute, the South Africa Institute, was to really study this question of how do you take knowledge and use it to, to improve policy? How do you link research with uh, policy making? Nobody had ever studied this in the Arab world. People have studied this in the Western world and still have not got a really clear idea of, of the mechanisms that can be applied in every case because every case is different. We just started to do this. We we had a program project, a, a research uh, project that was uh, announced two days ago. That was the results were Fadi Jandali did an extraordinary study uh, of uh, uh, health related issues of um, social security insurance issues in Lebanon to to analyze the policy process, how that policy 
it was the voluntary insurance. Uh, how that policy was made in Lebanon, by going back, tracing it backwards, 10, 15 years. Um, we had an, another extraordinary study that Riemann and Ash led the uh, process of tobacco control, uh, where, where again they used, in, they used knowledge and they interacted with policymakers and they helped to bring about changes in the laws. These, these are both two very interesting examples of how we are trying to apply the research capabilities of AUB to study how policy is made, and in some cases, if people like the Tobacco Control Group want to influence policy, or civil, working with civil society as they did and others do, uh, we're learning about how to do this. Nobody has ever systematically studied policy making and how to influence policy making and how to inject knowledge and research into it. And nobody's ever studied this systematically in the Arab world, and this is the whole raison d'etre of our Institute. So by combining our work with the faculty members uh, across AUB, uh, especially in the health sciences as our co-partners in this, we're trying to bring together these two worlds of, of knowledge and policy and to understand them better. And you'll hear a lot more about this in the next year or two. We've got three or four studies that have been launched that are underway and several others will be launched around other Arab countries because we, in a way, developed this methodology that now has been developed here uh, and will be applied in other countries. So how to study policy making is now something that uh, we have a better idea uh, about. So it's, it's going to be very exciting uh, as this process uh, goes forward. Someone said, yeah, I'm uh, a psychologist from LAU. I was just wondering, because Rima, you said a lot of things about time, 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 and, <laughs> and all of these kind of things. So I'm just thinking about the practicalities of these things and wondering whether um, you considered um, looking at uh, youth uh, groups that are already self-organized, like youth that are taking it on to study their electoral process or do something about that, um, skateboarding groups, um, po uh, poetry groups, musicians, you know, that, that are interested in social change. And I was just wondering if anybody in the group has, has um, thought about that possibility for research. Thank you very, for the very interesting presentation. I'm Justin Dion from the Faculty of Health Sciences. I wanted to just raise the question, Rami, you were saying that this whole interface between researchers and policymakers and research informing policymakers. I just wanted to raise the other side of the coin, which is policymakers as gatekeepers for allowing certain knowledge to be created and not other forms of knowledge. So a few, I think a couple of years ago, you held a youth conference and someone who'd been involved with one of the few youth surveys in Egypt because uh, there haven't been many youth surveys in the region. We are very restricted in the number of surveys that have been done, but there was one, there have been two now in Egypt. And she told a very interesting story about how their questionnaire got whittled down to what was allowed to be asked by the Egyptian government. And I think this is a very real issue. So we have very few surveys, and then within those surveys, we're very restricted in the questions that we can ask. And so I think as researchers, we have, I, mean, I, I would argue for two sides, one is to try and influence the process in getting the right questions asked, you know, that are conceptually based, that are evidence-based, you know, that are strong and that may address sensitive issues. Uh, and then, then, then helping to analyze those and, and to, to, to convey it further. So. Um, I think this is a reality of the politics of the modern Arab world, the control systems that some governments have used, and it's not only governments, there are other constraints on researchers, the local politics, uh, sectarianism, religion, uh, about tribal values, political and uh, private business interests, there's many kinds of constraints, uh, security issues, uh, so uh, all of these have been uh, constraints that researchers have suffered from, and journalists and, and other people, um, and I think it's one of the reasons why uh, some young people went out into the streets starting on December 17, 2010 in Sidi Bouzid in rural Tunisia and this spread throughout the whole region. One of the main findings of the two-year study we did on youth in the Arab world uh, with UNICEF was the, if there was one single main finding that came out of all of the research that we collected and, and the field work we did, 
it was that young people in, in all the areas, whether it was a wealthy country like Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or a poor country like Yemen or a cosmopolitan place like Cairo, it didn't matter where it was, most young people felt terribly constrained by many different kinds of forces that were constraining them, including the family, religion, politics, security, uh, business interests, foreign armies, occupation armies, invading armies, uh, tribal groups, militias, you name it, uh, teachers, uh, every aspect of their society imposed some controls and constraints on young people. They didn't fight it in the early days, I mean in before 2010. What they did is they just went around it and created their own spaces in the mosque, in the mall, in the neighborhood, behind the schoolyard, in the street, walking around in the city. They created their own spaces, or virtually on the web. And they lived double lives, many young people did. They were behaving and doing what was expected of them at home and at school and at work. And then they were doing what they really wanted to do in their other lives. They weren't contradictory lives. It's not that young people were doing something in public and something in private. They were, they were the same people. They just weren't allowed to express their views in some context, and they created other contexts in which they could express them. So this problem of constraints and controls by many different forces in society is one of the most important ones, and it's one of the reasons why we've had these eruptions of uh, revolutions and, and uprisings. Uh, and we'll see now in a country like Tunisia or Egypt or Libya, which are the, the most advanced and, and involving, into new uh, conditions of governance and power. We'll see if there is more space. And I think one of the things that people like us in research and public policy and think tanks and media, one of the things we need to do is to, to push those boundaries. Uh, and the best way to do it is through honest, good quality research that cannot be challenged by, uh, by governments. Uh, well, they will, some of them will try, but if you, have, if you can defend your work on the basis of accuracy and integrity, uh, it's very hard for people to suppress it. Uh, and this is hopefully one of the things that we'll be able to do. Uh, I'll just add to that, I think that the importance of various kinds of research methods helps us to bring out the various aspects of these lives. So quali quantitative survey research may be one way, and qualitative research is another way, anthropological, sort of um, deep anthropology is another way. And each of those will give us different aspects, but I think the important thing is to bring you's voice um, out very clearly in all this. In terms of uh, your question, Samar, I think it's interesting because you could look at communities from a physical aspect, and that's sort of where we're starting, and I don't know if Charles wants to add to this, but I think another way to look at communities is sort of social. Um, and again, the whole, the whole thinking was to start somewhere and then see where it got us. And we were interested in, in trying to take, to take all of the interest areas of the various members and find a location, a place, a physical community where we could explore these issues with young people um, and create, uh, create change in that community um, or try. Uh, but I think it might be interesting to think about looking at a community as a social group and then doing the assessment that way. Do you want to add anything on physical versus social group and where we start? Charles was a member of the steering, what was the steering um, well, we're still at the, uh, the early stages. Uh, on this one. Oh, uh, we're still at the early stages of looking at uh, the first Beirut project. And eventually, once we're going to be um, the four different communities around Hush um, Beirut, and we open that space in the middle for, for these also communities to interact. Then we will also see some different dynamics emerge if we manage to get that space opened up. Um, but also, uh, rather than looking at groups in terms of poets or other kind of identities, once we get into those locations, we see what groups are available, which ones are active, how they are active, how do they interact. So make it more of an amic kind of bottom up approach and see what's what we have to deal with. Um, but yeah, that's also a, a, a line to go through. Hi, I'm Hanna from Muhammad Association, also a student at AMD. I was wondering if are you planning at some point uh, working with NGOs on 
establishing whatever research you want to do, I think it would be a good asset for both you and them since some associ associations and NGOs already have um, established youth groups and uh, who are ready and are actually excited about working in such programs. Thank you. Okay, so that I think goes back to the methodology or the process. The idea of a community, then once once one says this is the community that we're working, the first step is to see who's in that community and to engage everybody in that community. So uh, NGOs, uh, the young people themselves, the schools, um, health centers, whoever is in that community. So the, that's the first aspect, is just establishing contact meeting people, telling them you know, what this idea is about, figuring out who's interested, and then creating a group of all of those people that are talking to each other. Uh, what we've often found in communities is that there's a lot of excellent work happening, but there's very little integration and coordination amongst groups. And so part of the idea is to get people around the same table, talking together, and debating these issues back and forth, um, and, and so that we're all co-learning from each other. So absolutely, I think NGOs, um, have a very long history in Lebanon in almost every sector of excellent work in, at the community level. And they're a very critical aspect of any work that we would do. This is in the future. Oh, the this, um, this is all, I mean, so the, the, it's in the future to some extent, but it's, that's how we would start even the, 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 any project that we do. So once we, we move into a community, the first step is actually finding out who's working in that community. So we're not going in over and above established uh, entities or organizations in any community. We're actually with working within that community with the people in that community. People being organizations, whether NGOs, governments, schools, whoever is working there. And to bring everybody around the table to talk. I'm not meaning this in a Hiwad uh, type. Um, uh, just as an open, what are, what are the issues around young people? The nice thing about the topic of youth is everybody is interested in this topic and everybody has something to say about it. So, so it brings people together. It doesn't bring people apart, actually. Uh, linking the Hewan to Rami's uh, previous uh, 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 discussion on uh, whether there are best practices or not research done on how to affect policies. Uh, uh, have you like, uh, just like uh, brainstormed on the pros and cons of maybe involving uh, one way or another uh, the government anyway, or maybe, I don't know, a municipality in a certain kind of community action-based uh, project and whether that would uh, uh, facilitate or bridge the, the gap between that community and the government itself and maybe also uh, uh, give more like uh, power to the recommendations you may have in the uh, project. For the projects that we have to the research projects to study public policy making, we absolutely have to engage with policy makers at different levels. We have one project now that looks very much at Parliament in Lebanon and how Parliament plays a role in uh, policy making and laws. Other uh, projects are doing interviews with ministers, former ministers, the civil service, every level of government. We haven't gone to local government yet, but this is definitely something that we need to do. So look at local government, regional governments, national government, and then you have the different elements that, you know, in every, in every country, the very top, the president of the king, and then you have the parliament, cabinet, the ministry, the bureaucracy, uh, and then there's the informal policy makers. People have real power, but they're not sitting in parliament or the, or the prime minister. They have other places in society. So this is what we're trying to understand, how power and policy intersect. Mm -hmm. And this is how we define policy making, not just how do you make a law or how do you pass a decree, but who are the players, where are the constraints, what are the interests, what are the barriers, what facilitates them, what are the entry points if you want to go and get something done, where do you start? Uh, so we're just in the early stages, we've only been doing this for about two years now, but it's picking up and we're identifying colleagues around the region who are interested in this and, and working with them so that these kinds of studies can be done in five or six or eight countries around the Arab world simultaneously. Our next step, which we'll do this year, is to convene an annual uh, policy conference on public policy research to have those scholars who do these kinds of studies come together, share experiences, and publish things. So, uh, but this is a process that's in its early stages still.
Thank you. This was very informative, and uh, we look forward to particularly this first study. I was wondering whether you, uh, uh, in parallel with this, were thinking about the areas that are most important for working with you, and whether members of this team who are involved in, I know, for instance, the area she just said, is involved in some other studies. So the group and this study will be involved maybe in other what you call disciplinary studies and where they will be looking at uh, uh, at areas of you. Uh, and do you have, do you, do you have an, uh, I mean, a kind of, uh, some, I mean, not list, but some conceptual idea of your themes and what you would be interested in in you other than this exploratory study that will come out from the ground? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, uh, what we've started with, and this is how we're going to, we hope to engage other people, and that's why I was saying one of the ideas is to get content papers. So what we started with, a, a, I guess almost a year ago now, or in, in uh, yeah, last year, is to ask the steering committee members to submit concept papers about their own, how they would want to move their own research forward. And we got seven, everybody actually submitted a concept paper, it was wonderful. Um, and what we did then is we created thematics amongst them. So we didn't want to go forward with seven concept papers. We tried to, to bring them together um, so that people that were looking more at health-related outcomes, we tried to get them to work together. And those that were looking more at the, pre, the precursor. So uh, for example, a lot of my work is on dignity. Charles had works on identity. Uh, that we were, were put together to put one concept paper together. There was a bunch of work that was looking at media and cyberspace, and we tried to get those together. Um, and so even in moving forward, I think the idea is to look disciplinary, but at the same time to try to manage many, many projects and, uh, you know, and the ability for us to, to move forward. And to bring people together, yeah, to bring people together across disciplines on areas that are similar to each other. Um, and not be doing seven concept papers, but perhaps three. Um, and those would be much more disciplinary than the HUSH project that, that we're talking about, but still not one discipline. And we're hoping that that will happen across the university as people join in um, the working group and submit sort of their thinking. And our concept papers were brief. They were a page and a half to two. We weren't asking for much. We were just saying, put an idea on paper. Tell us what it is. Tell us what you're interested in. But the minute you start to gather them all and look across, it's very interesting to see the thematics that just automatically pop up. Um, everybody, but all four of us read them. And, um, and actually, all of the same committee members read all of the concept papers. And that was nice as well, because that's where we learn from each other. So yeah, definitely, we'll be moving in our more disciplinary aspects, as well as this very multidisciplinary. And even in the multidisciplinary project, we, I mean, because again, we are, um, we are academics after all. And so while we're thinking about uh, action and change and policy making, we're also thinking about how do we get this both disseminated in academic publications and in more local newspapers accessible to everybody as we're, as we're working on change. And so even though multidisciplinary, we're thinking about one could technically take out their piece, their piece of it and actually publish on that piece. But we can also have some very multidisciplinary um, aspects of it in the publications. All right, thank you all very much for coming. Um,